Stage 35, indirect statement. Okay, as always, we're going to start in English. Look at these two sentences. I am tired, which is really true right now. And also, Mr. Allen says that he is tired. Note the difference there. Same with these. My brother can do it versus she thinks that her brother can do it. So you might have noticed that in the first statement here, I am tired and my brother can do it, we have a declarative statement. And then the second sentence in each pair, Mr. Allen says that he is tired, she thinks that her brother can do it. The same information is conveyed, it's just reported slightly differently. So now we get to our definitions. What in the world is indirect statement? Well, to talk about indirect statement, we have to talk about what is direct statement. And that's something that is stated, you know, directly, like Mr. Allen is tired. Indirect statement is this. It's reporting a statement of what someone said, felt, heard, thought, understood, believed, etc. without using that person's exact words. Now, this idea of indirect speech is not new to you because you've already seen examples in Latin of other things that are stated indirectly. And those specifically are indirect questions and commands. So indirect statement is just another form of indirect speech. Now, let's review indirect questions and, and commands really quickly, and then we're going to notice how they differ from how indirect statement is formed in Latin. So with indirect questions, here's an example. Custodes, nos rogaverunt cur clamaremus. The guards asked us why we were shouting. Well, the direct question would be, why are you shouting? And of course, indirect, it's reported. The guards asked us why we were shouting. If you'll notice, clamaremus uses the subjunctive. It's imperfect tense there. Indirect commands also use the subjunctive, legatus militibus imperavit ut redirent, the commander ordered the soldiers to go back. The direct command would have been, go back, an indirect command, you know, the commander ordered. Same deal, we have a subjunctive clause here. Now, if it's not an indirect question, if it's not an indirect command, but instead we have simply an indirect statement, a statement of factuality, actuality, we don't use the subjunctive. Instead, we use this formula right here. This is how you recognize indirect statements in Latin. The main verb of the sentence is going to be what's called a verb of the head. And we'll talk more about that in a second. It'll be followed by an accusative noun and then followed by an infinitive. And as you know, word order in Latin does matter. Most of the time, action verbs come at the end of a sentence or end of a clause. Typically, when we're at indirect statement, the verb of the head is going to come towards the beginning of the sentence, and then it'll be followed by the accusative with the infinitive coming at the end. And we'll see some examples in Latin in just a second. So let's start with verb of the head. What in the world does that mean? Well, these are verbs of thinking, feeling, perceiving, saying, etc. I gave a list here, and I, you need to pause and write it down in just a second. These are the most common verbs of the head that you're going to see in Latin. This is not certainly uh, uh, all of them by any means, but these are the ones you're going to see quite a bit. So go ahead and pause and copy those down. Okay, now that we are back, notice how we start with a verb of the head. And then, this is where it gets kind of bizarre. Remember, it's verb of the head plus accusative plus infinitive. So the subject of the infinitive will be in the accusative case. Normally, you know, we think about the accusative as being the direct object, right? It's a direct object. And we also think of, about translating infinitives as to verb. Usually we've seen them with some form of wolo or nolo or posum, like I want to run, I do not want to run, I am able to run. However, in indirect statement, the infinitive is translated like a normal old indicative verb, and the accusative, once again, acts as the subject of that infinitive. Let's take a look at some Latin examples uh, to clarify. I know it sounds confusing now, but once you see this enough times, it will become so easy. Check these out. Centurio dicet captivos dormire, which we've got a subject here, centurio, Dicet comes from dico to say, so we've got a verb of the head, and notice how it's towards the beginning of the sentence and not at the end. Verb of the head, followed by an accusative noun, followed by an infinitive. The centurion says that the prisoners are sleeping. Ha ha. Okay, check out this next one. Audio marcum in vila rustica habitare. So we have a verb of the head, audio 
and O means I, so I would be the subject. We have an accusative, and then at the end here, we have an infinitive. And remember, the accusative acts as the subject of the infinitive. I hear that Marcus is living in a country house. If you just look at that little subordinate clause there, that Marcus is living in a country house, Marcus is the subject. Same with the first sentence, that the prisoners are sleeping, the prisoners are the subject of sleeping. Look at the third example, magister putat filium meum diligenter laborare. So we have verb of the head right here with putat, comes from puto, to think. We have an accusative, filium meum, and then we have an infinitive, laborare. The teacher thinks that my son works diligently. And then, check out this last one. Oh, apaproditus non tiat domitiam ab imperatore relegari. So we have Epaphroditus announces that Domitia, there she is, accusative, but she's the subject of this indirect statement, subject of the uh, infinitive here, um, accusative that Domitia is being exiled by the emperor. Note in our first three examples, the infinitive was present active, dor mire habitare laborare, but of course in stage 34 you learned to make the present passive infinitive. It's really easy, you just typically chop off the e and put an i. If it's a third conjugation verb, you chop off the ere and put an i. And the same principle works. It's an infinitive, but since it's an indirect statement, you translate it like it's a normal old indicative verb, you would just translate it in the passive voice, present passive, is being exiled. A couple of other little things about indirect statement. Um, say is a reflexive pronoun that means himself, herself, itself, or themselves, and it always refers back to the subject of the entire sentence. All the examples I think that we've looked at so far, whoever the subject is of the entire sentence has not been the subject within the indirect statement. But you certainly need to, to, to do that in any language. And here's an example. Sawius dicit se in Italia habitare. Sawius says that he, meaning Sawius, lives in Italy. So se always refers back to the subject of the whole sentence. One last thing before we look at some additional examples. Um, translating indirect statements in general. We're going to be tackling indirect statements for a couple of months, actually. And it depends on the tense of the infinitive. And I want you to write this down and just kind of tuck it away in the back of your mind. It's going to be super easy for right now because the verbs of the head are all going to be present tense. And the infinitives are all going to be present tense. But eventually, you're going to learn that there are perfect tense infinitives and future tense infinitives. And then you're going to see sentences where the verb of the head is in the perfect tense or imperfect tense. And we have to figure out how to translate them. But for now... Just know that the present infinitive indicates action that is happening at the same time as the main verb, meaning the verb of the head. Always, always, always. All right, let's take a look at three more examples, then we're done. Um, and I tried to use the three kinds of infinitives that we know, present active, present passive, and also deponent, because we can't forget about those. You learned the list in stage 34. Look at number one, nuntius skit fratrum meum in Britannia habitare. So we have a verb of the head, skit, comes from skio, skire, to know. The messenger knows that, ooh, accusative here, that my brother is living in Britain. Pretty straightforward, present active infinitive. Number two, kaisar dicit epistula miti. This is a third conjugation infinitive. It would be mitere, but third conjugation when they become passive, and those infinitives become passive, you chop off the whole ere and add a long i. We got the verb of the head right here with dicit, and we have our accusative there. So Caesar, so Caesar says that the letter is being sent. Sounds awkward in English, but that's what the Latin says. And then finally, let's look at one that uses this deponent infinitive, egredi. Cinturio putat exercitum e castris egredi. So we have our verb of the head with putat, coming from puto to think. Exercitum is our accusative uh, subject of the infinitive, and there's our infinitive, egredi. So the centurion thinks that the army is leaving the camp. All right, that's it. Pretty easy.